today's live Q&A session with our presenter and expert speaker, Ardi Kola. Ardi is the author of the GDPR Handbook, which has been published by Kogan Page recently. Um, he's Executive Fellow and Director of the GDPR Programme at the Henley Business School. Ardi is also founder of GoDPO and Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Data Protection and Privacy. He's also made numerous television experiences, appearances on the subject of data protection, including an interview on Sky News on GDPR Enforcement Day. Ardi, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, the star of stage and screen. <laughs> That's <laughs> you, Tom, not me. Um, it was actually good fun going on the air, both on the radio and TV, but it is a bit nerve wracking because you have to hang around in the background for a little while until they finish what they're talking about. And then you're thrust into a chair while they're still talking about something else. And then they turn to you and um, your heartbeat goes up and hopefully your mind is still in the right place and you can answer their questions. So hopefully this won't be that experience this afternoon, but you never know. Um, what we're going to do this afternoon is that Tom is going to fire questions at me, a bit like mastermind, really. <laughs> mm -hmm. And hopefully I won't pass on any of the questions and hopefully we'll be able to point you in the right direction. Um, so we've got an hour um, and uh, we want to keep it reasonably friendly and open. And I think if we've got some time, there may be some time to, to squeeze in some more questions at the end. I know that Tom's got some stuff to talk to you about as well. <laughs> At the end of uh, end of the end of the session. So, if you're ready, Tom, let's go. Absolutely. Okay. So we've got um, questions that were submitted in, in advance for from our attendees today. And in order, I've got some general ones to open up with. And the first one we've got from Simon Hinks. Do you believe we will break the cycle of trusted brands losing large amounts of our data through ignorance and arrogance of data security? Well, it's a uh, it's an interesting opening question about ignorance and arrogance. That doesn't sound great, does it? Um, the, reality, the reality is that most organizations aren't ignorant and arrogant. We know the ones who are, but let's be clear. Most organizations take this stuff pretty seriously, in my experience. I'm sure in yours as well. So if they're doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do, they really haven't got anything to fear from complying with these higher standards within the general data protection regulation and of course if you're in the UK the data protection act of 2018 which if you like incorporates the GDPR incorporates the legal enforcement directive and it also includes other stuff which isn't in the GDPR things like immigration things like national security so that's quite important too so the landscape has definitely changed um, for us at Henley Business School, which is where we teach a large number of very big organizations, we've trained about a thousand senior managers on a one day program, for example. For us, this is more about reputation rather than just regulation. And that's really, really important. I was talking to a journalist about that point only just a few uh, days ago, where actually organizations understand that there are issues in relation to how they process your and my personal data and they don't really want to get the kind of news headlines that perhaps other organizations have attracted notably most recently of course if you've been watching the news in the uk or even on the bbc tsb bank where i've been called on to onto the bbc to talk about that that's not great is it you don't really want to be become famous for all the wrong reasons so Ultimately, it's about putting the, the, the interests of your customers, your clients, if you're a voluntary sector organization, your supporters, and of course, your employees at the center of your thinking when it comes to data protection, processing and security of their personal data. Great. And we have another general question from Giacomo Frigi, who asks, what documents do I need to demonstrate I am GDPR compliant? Well, that's great. And I think um, you're absolutely on the right lines by asking about documentation. So um, the GDPR places a heavier burden on the shoulders of everyone involved in processing personal data in so far as we need to keep records. That's really, really important. Records of processing activities. It's actually in the GDPR. It's sort of spelt out a bit. Yeah. 
there was an exception and I'll deal with that point now there was an exception for smaller organizations under 250 employees where they didn't have to keep records of processing activities but in my view and I think in the view of others that's a bit strange because you have to comply with the whole of the regulation and it's evidential based which is why your question is so important we have to keep records what we're doing we must keep a record of that even things that we don't decide to do we may come back to this point a bit later for example we decide not to appoint a DPO we still have to record that decision that decision still has to remain on the record because should there be a personal data breach and unfortunately that may happen to any of us on this uh, webinar today um, we would need to let the regulator know from the regulated market and indeed the supervisory authority that's the the new term for the data protection authority supervisory authority that's the ico in the uk it will be uh, another type of uh, organization but still a supervisory authority wherever you are in the world in the European Union you'd have to uh, give them the evidence of what you've done which has been appropriate which has helped to mitigate risk and that's really really important point early on in this webinar we're talking about a risk-based approach and that means making sure we're recording what we're doing making sure it's appropriate making sure that we're putting in place the appropriate organizational and technical measures we need to do to mitigate high or very high risk and reduce that to a residual risk because actually in in life there's no such thing as a risk-free processing of personal data everyone gets that so you reduce it to residual risk the difference is it shouldn't cause harm or damage so recording what you're doing making sure that you've got a strategy in place making sure that you've mapped out your data flows in terms of where the personal data is running through your organization or your company whether that particular type of personal data and we all have different types of personal data in fact at Enley we recognize there were 15 different types so you've got to decide, decide which type it is record what that is and then think is that high risk medium risk or low risk and that's something which you need to consider given what you do, given the nature of your work. I mean, if you're working in the healthcare sector, for example, it's immediately assumed it's high risk. Um, and then take steps to mitigate that and reduce that. And of course, um, not only do what's known as a data protection impact assessment, which you need to record. Um, and again, post a data breach, the Information Commissioner's Office here in the UK can actually ask to read it. So, you know, make sure we do that properly. Following that, following that record that you've got, the data protection impact assessment, or indeed the step before, which um, we call DPIA Lite, L-I-T-E. You can find out more about that um, on LinkedIn, for example, where I've written about that. Provided you've got all that clear, you're then in a position to move forward in terms of putting in place organizational and technical measures. And there you have to record that. So again, sorry about the length of the answer, but organizational measures, would include training and technical measures would include putting in uh, technology where you're able to record the things you can do in relation to processing of personal data putting in fields that maybe you don't have at the moment um, for example once the purposes for which you've been processing that person's personal data have been satisfied then there should be something which flags up on the system to say that actually unless there's any other lawful basis to continue to hold on to that personal data which is still deemed to be processing it you should erase it it's those kind of things so bear in mind we're now living in a world where everything is transparent okay and moving on we have a question from lan louis who asks in a specific term how will companies be inspected in terms of compliance well People seem to think that um, the Information Commissioner's Office have got spies everywhere or um, um, they seem to have a hotline to what's going on. Well, in many respects, the spies out there are ordinary people. Um, what they tend to do, if there is a personal data breach, is people tend to speak to each other about it, interestingly. And I got that impression very much since I've been on the television and radio talking about about data breaches because sadly that's what happens that get, gets into the news headlines and a lot of 
data breaches have quite a big consequence and people don't don't feel very comfortable about it, don't feel very um, safe in relation to the data that they've shared about themselves. And so they will talk about that on social media, interestingly. So the first time perhaps the information commissioner finds out something's not gone well is in fact they're monitoring social media, which you may or may not have guessed. And of course, that's a reasonable assumption to make. The second thing is it's much easier now to make a complaint. And um, although it's in the GDPR and we yet to see how it works in practice, there is a thing called a one-stop shop mechanism. So irrespective of where the problem is, and if it's affecting you in different territories, you don't have to report it to every single supervisory authority. You can do that to one supervisory authority and they kind of act as the lead supervisory authority in that case. And then of course, you're expected to be given uh, a data privacy notice where people are processing your personal data and that has to comply with the, with the law, with the GDPR. And of course, if it doesn't, then that's actually a breach in itself. And if you make a subject access request and that hasn't been responded to within the time limit, that's now 30 days. Yes, it does include weekends, unfortunately, for those of you who work in this area. Um, it was 40 days before. Again, if you don't do that again, potentially there's a problem there. And just on that final point, um, when we teach people at Henley Business School, and certainly I've mentioned it in, in the GDPR handbook, the subject access request is actually quite important. That means you can find out what's being processed about you, what personal information they have on you, and you're entitled to, to see that subject to certain caveats. For example, it can't infringe the rights and freedoms and interests of another person, for example. So um, that's important too. So it's not an absolute right. And of course, they have to um, identify you, verify your identity, which is very important too. So um, subject to that getting done um, properly, then that's absolutely fine. And then you can put another subject access request in to ensure that, for example, if you wanted any erasure of your personal data, then that's been done. However, if organizations are getting a load of these subject access requests and they're sort of building up, building up, and they're not actually compliant with the, the time scale, remember it was within 30 days, so don't wait for the 29th day to turn up and then decide to respond that tends to indicate there's a deeper problem below the surface so it's important to get these kind of hygiene things bang on great okay and we have a question from Catherine Hanrahan who asks how does GDPR impact the hosting of customer data of non-GDPR markets like the USA for example if the data is hosted in France Okay, let's try to untangle this a little bit. I understand what you're saying there, but if I can help you here, first of all, the GDPR does apply globally. So we need to think about the GDPR being a global standard, not just a European one. Now, that applies wherever the processing of personal data from within the European Union and Catherine, that could be a European Union citizen or subject, but also a non-European Union citizen or subject who could be, for example, on holiday in the European Union. It also protects their data. So it's irrespective of where that data is physically being processed. It's about where those decisions are being made in terms of the means and purposes for processing that personal data. And of course, if you're in the US, and you could be processing personal data there. If it's European Union citizens data, then most clearly you have to comply. Now, the mechanism for complying, there are a couple of options here, not to get too detailed, Tom, but one of them is Privacy Shield. I'll come back to that in a minute. That's if you like an agreement between um, the Department um, uh, of uh, State in the United States and the European Commission agreeing that certain things will be complied with in relation to the processing of European Union personal data. That's a sort of self-certifying uh, scheme so people can voluntarily join that and there's quite a large number of uh, organizations. I think about 5,000 American companies are on that list. If they're not on that list, then they have to think about other forms of protection and typically that would be what's known as standard contractual clauses or SCCs and I've spelt that out in some detail uh, 
um, in the book. Um, those are mechanisms to ensure that people's personal data are is treated in exactly this kind of way in which it would be if it were in the European Union. So it's important to realise that the footprint of the GDPR is much wider than simply the European Union. It does indeed uh, take into account the United States um, and they do have to comply with those regulations. Now, I did say I'll come back to the Privacy Shield issue. At the moment, um, Catherine, there's a big debate as to whether the Privacy Shield mechanism is actually working effectively and there are calls now within the European Commission to have it suspended. So if you're working in a business which is doing a huge amount of personal data flows between the European Union and the United States, then I would suggest looking at the legal protections around that which you need to have in place and quite possibly look at standard contractual clauses. Great, okay, and we can move on now to a couple of questions about data protection officers, um, which I'm sure there are plenty of in this, in this webinar room. Um, from Joanna Kennedy, she asks, for a newly appointed DPO for whom it will be a small part of their existing role, is there any training slash reading that you would recommend? Great question, Joanne. Now, uh, first of all, I have to declare an interest I'm in fact a DPO. I'm not a full-time DPO. I'm a DPO under contract. I only do one day a week uh, because that's what the business requires. And it's for um, one of my clients who oh, I can tell you that because obviously I'm, it's in the public domain, it's Hitachi. So I think the first thing, Joanne, is to think about what the nature of this role is about. And for the vast majority of organizations, including the one I work with, it's about understanding three things business continuity, risk, and technology. So not everyone has got huge amounts of expertise and knowledge and experience in all those areas, but you're expected to understand that because you're giving guidance and advice, you're not making decisions as to the means and purposes for processing personal data. You are in that role acting independently. And a quite important point of your question is, which has to be mentioned right at the front, is that you can't have a conflict of interest. That's really, really important. It's the reason why I've been brought on board with Hitachi. So there can't be a conflict of interest. Um, what we do is we train people to be a senior manager responsible for data protection, privacy and security at Henley Business School. Um, we have a very, very strong program there, recognized by the whole industry as being a leading program in Europe, the only business school program there. Um, that's certainly important, and we've trained a lot of DPOs. So you might want to have a look at that. And if you're not sure whether that's something perhaps the business can support or maybe you might want to do, get hold of the book, re read the book, because the book is based on the program. I can't put the whole program in the book, obviously, but the book will give you a bit of a sense a bit of a flavour on how we think about these things. But certainly, it doesn't preclude people coming from different backgrounds. And I think that's quite an important point. It's a point made by the, uh, by the International Association of Privacy Professionals, the IAPP, who we also work with, who are the biggest professional body representing the interests of data protection professionals globally. So we're recognised by, by lots of uh, organisations, but it's a commitment. And the bigger commitment really is to commit to continue to learn, to continue to keep up to date, to continue to provide the best level of advice based on experience and looking at other practices in other sectors and other industries and other markets. Really hard to do when you're sitting at your desk in your office. Perhaps that's where you know the role of the business school comes in. And with regard to the DPO responsibility, Adi, um, one of the responsibilities is auditing the company and its data processes. Joanna, is there a particular frequency or format that can be expected? Okay, well, the, the audit, you have to use the word audit in a quite a diff different way, actually, Joanne. I mean, you're not, you're not an auditor. You're a data protection officer. So you're there to be um, consulted early on, not later on. So if you're working for an organization, let's say that's producing products and services, and let's say they're producing new products and services, then 
really you need to be there at the beginning of that conversation with the research and development people with the sales and marketing people with the IT people um, with other people involved in that, that process to make sure that we haven't overlooked um, the data protection privacy and security features that need to be embedded into that products and service moving forward that's actually a requirement of the GDPR it also makes perfect sense if you think about it so there's no such thing as an audit but clearly you are there to identify areas of the organizational business where there may be a high or very high risk of harm or damage to a customer or a client as a result of processing their personal data that harm or damage could also extend to employees and contractors and subcontractors as well so you're really there to kind of identify that and then to make sure that a data protection impact assessment is done in accordance with the principles it doesn't necessarily spell out in detail this is how you do it because there isn't a kind of template although in the book i have provided a bit of a template there has been some really good guidance on it as well which you could argue is also a template and there are lots of other tools around as well that look like templates so you've got lots of help there but that's really really important so if you identify for example hr being an area and that is an area quite often for organizations and companies where they've been processing a huge amount of personal data for years and years and years they've got cvs on file which go back I know 10 years or something you wonder what are we still doing processing it because even though we're not doing anything with it we're still processing that data so there needs to be a kind of clear out if you like a sort of sweep um, of all of that kind of stuff and so therefore you might want to do an EPIA and then out of the recommendations which you're overseeing by the way you're overseeing that and you're working with your colleagues to produce that you then have to put in place you know, appropriate organizational and technical measures and check that those things have worked through. Um, maybe a bit later, Tom, I'll talk a bit about um, a, a, a way in which you can do that quite effectively and, and certainly which we did at Hitachi. Sounds good. And now, Ardi, um, I've got a few questions here which are all um, on the subject of marketing and how GDPR impacts people's outreach work, which um, has been a pretty hot topic we can agree um, a couple yeah. of quick fire ones to, to start from echo shang um, who asks does gdpr apply to contact information collected before the regulation gdpr most definitely applies to any form of processing of personal data from this point onwards irrespective of when you collected that personal data so the answer is most definitely yes it does does information collected from customer calls come under GDPR? Yes, it does. <laughs> and from did you, Anna want these short, did you want them any shorter? Because I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how to answer this any shorter than that. <laughs> and perhaps we can dig a little deeper into these next few. Yeah. Anna, let, Anna, let me just let me just put you on pause a little bit. Um, I knew these questions were coming, so we kind of had a bit of a chat before we came on air, which is always helpful because I have no idea what these questions are. So what I did this morning, and you might find that really helpful, is I did something which you might find quite interesting. I took the Ladybird book approach to some of this stuff about marketing, GDPR, and which we haven't come on to yet, but we will do, I'm sure, PECA which is the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulation. So what I did is I posted something up on LinkedIn. So if you find me on LinkedIn, you'll find the uh, marketing cheat sheet. Um, and I've done it in the way that perhaps if it were a Ladybird book, how it would be written. So I hope you might find that useful, but carry on with your questions, Tom. And our next one from Anna Corfi, who asks, does GDPR fundamentally change the way email marketing campaigns are done? Specifically, a company receives or finds an email address of someone who has never done business with them before, and you email them. Is there anything prohibiting us, prohibiting us from doing that? Okay. Well, the first thing to say is it's not just about the GDPR. Uh, we've actually got to comply with other rules and regulations. And in that case, in terms of email marketing, that's actually under what I've just described, the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulation, or PECA. Now, um, 
that is actually under review at the moment, but it won't become a new law probably until in, in the new year. So we're stuck with PECA. When it is a new law, probably in autumn next year, it will be called the e-privacy regulation. You probably heard some stuff about that. There's some people tweeting about that now. And it's meant to be in alignment with the GDPR. What that means is things have to be transparent, accountable, and putting control back into the hands of you and me, the customer, the client, the supporter, if you're a voluntary sector organization dealing with that individual and indeed the employee. So bear that in mind. It also has to comply with the principles of processing personal data. That too is in the GDPR. So, to and again, I've covered this this morning in the, the cheat sheet, but just for the purposes of answering the question, um, if you've got a business to business relationship with someone and you've been doing business and business with them, then you can continue to market to them, provided you give them the option of not receiving any further marketing, you're absolutely fine. There was never a need. There was never a need to send out those zombie GDPR emails that cluttered up your inbox, my inbox, your mum's inbox, and your child's inbox. It shouldn't have happened there at all. There was absolutely no need to do that. It was a complete and utter waste of time and actually in many respects was a breach before the 25th of May because in fact you have to have permission to send a marketing email to someone prior to the GDPR. So actually they were breaking the law trying to pretend that they were trying to get you to comply with the law. All a bit strange, all a bit unnecessary and actually all a bit damaging for that for that brand. Post the 25th of May, direct marketing is a legitimate interest. And that means you have to carry out an assessment in terms of whether you have a legitimate interest. In fact, I've written something recently um, uh, on it. And in fact, we've had a, a webinar on it, haven't we, Tom, on legitimate interest. So yeah. um, you need to look at um, the purpose. That's pretty imp important. So you need to have a, a purpose. That's to be a lawful purpose. And within that legitimate interest, think, is there a way in which I don't have to process someone's personal data? Because I was just saying this to a friend of mine recently. I said, we kind of, people make the assumption that we always have to process personal data. Well, actually, if you can get away with having to process personal data, great news is it's out of scope of the GDPR because the GDPR is only about personal data. But also you're taking steps to minimize risk by taking this principle of data minimization, trying to less data being processed, the better. But if we have to, then what's our purpose? What's the necessity for that? And then I think the third test of it is like an expectation test, really. Would someone expect us to be sending them that information? Does it impact their, what they call the rights and freedoms and interests, et cetera? Now, provided everything looks okay, and I've written another thing about this under the kind of banner, does it feel creepy or cool? And I really have gone out there and said, is it creepy or cool? Not because it's in the GDPR, but does that feel creepy or cool is a really good way of thinking well actually if it felt creepy and if I was on the receiving end it's probably not the right thing to do so relax <laughs> lots of people have got themselves into a right mess over this they don't need to if you've got an existing b2b relationship that's absolutely fine if it's business to consumer you can do that under legitimate interest you do not need consent unless you absolutely need to do that and it's the most appropriate legal basis and it may not be so legitimate interest can, can can work there provided of course that it's appropriate you're not it's not unexpected and people have the option of not receiving anything further i hope that helps so without explicit consent how is an in-house pr specialist allowed to reach out to editors and journalists for general pr submissions and i would guess the answer is via legitimate interest well let's let's remember that what are journalists doing and what are pr people doing and um, i can speak also as someone who has been involved in public relations and marketing for over 20 years and um, there's absolutely no question We've got to start from the principle of thinking of a risk based approach, because that is what we're talking about here, Tom. We're talking about a risk based approach. So contacting a journalist who have got their details, who want stories, who are looking for information to look at facts, check those facts. And you are a 
professional public relations person, tell me, does that sound risky? No, of course it's not. It's what's expected. Now, what isn't expected is you're trying to sell them all sorts of products and services and you're chasing them down the street. You're profiling them and finding out what they eat for breakfast and all the rest of it. And then you're selling that data to other people who might want to contact them. Well, that's a no, no. You shouldn't be doing that. You're profiling them. They need to know about that. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a very low level of risk in relation to processing that individual's personal data. And actually, when you flip the coin over, they've got enhanced rights to do what they need to do under the GDPR themselves. They don't have to always get consent to process personal data because they're journalists. They're in the media, it's about democracy and all those good things. So just again, look at this sensibly. Of course you can do that. But, you know, be appropriate. Um, if a journalist didn't want to hear from you again, you constantly contacted them, they may get, well, it's, counter, it's counterproductive anyway, and hopefully you haven't annoyed a journalist and they do that. But if they did, then clearly you shouldn't be chasing them and you shouldn't be processing their personal data. They may want to make a complaint. And in fact, the complaint may not even be to the ICO if it's in the UK. It may be if you're a member of the Chartered Institute of Public Relations, which... I would suggest that all of you are, or a member of the Public Relations Consultants Association, and I've been on the board of both, then you know you have a code of conduct, don't you? And of course, as PR people, you're very much in the front line in terms of breaking news stories, giving information to things which can have quite big reputation impacts on organizations, on individuals and, and companies, etc. So you're in a position of trust, so you have to act in accordance with your professionalism and in, and, in, and in accordance with those code of conduct. Great, all makes, all makes sense. And further on the um, subjects of legitimate interest, question from Louise Winston, who asks, the ICO says that B2B marketing is okay to a business email address under legitimate interest. What we are unsure of is whether that business email address has to be a generic info at, or if it can include an individual's name. Um, I think ultimately you are connecting with someone who can be identified or is identifiable. So really speaking, personal data, the definition of personal data, which is under Article 4 of the GDPR, includes pretty much everything. So, but it can't be, you know, personal data isn't something which is wholly generic, which can't identify someone. So if it is someone's name that's identifiable, if it's just under info at whoever.com, um, I would argue whether that was actually personal data or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have a question from Kristin Gilfassen who asks, how are emails asking people to opt out if they no longer want to be on a mailing list complying with GDPR? Should they not use opt-in? Well, the first thing to say is we've gone, back, we've gone back to the zombie email question again, Jill. Um, first of all, if it's business to business, you've got the answer there. It's in the cheat sheet, which you can find on LinkedIn. So hopefully that will help you. If it's business to consumer, you can still use legitimate interest. But of course, you have to do the legitimate interest test assessment that I just went through. Make sure you record that because that's important. You can't just assume you've got legitimate interest. A lot of um, American companies just assume they've got legitimate interest and they don't really understand it. Remember the other thing, which again, I think we forget, is that legitimate interest is only one of six legal grounds for processing personal data. You don't have to use legitimate interest, but it is the last one in the list of things that you can do. So it may be appropriate. What the ICO have said, which I think I've, which is very useful guidance, and they've, they've actually, um, I'll come back to their website in a minute, because there's something which might help you, Jill, on this. But what they say in terms of their guidance is you should only use legitimate interest where there's a lower level of risk involved in relation to the processing of personal data, not a high level of risk, because that wouldn't be appropriate. So you couldn't use legitimate interest to process a child's personal data, for example. That wouldn't be appropriate whatsoever. Um, on the ICO website, they've actually got some really cool tools where you can, if you're not sure which legal basis to use, they ask you a series of questions and you put your responses in and it will come up with a suggested, a suggested way of um, 
moving forward in terms of the legal basis for processing. But always remember this, irrespective of the legal basis for processing, whether that's consent, whether that's contract, whether that's a, a, a lawful power that you may have, whether that's legitimate interest, whether you're acting under other grounds, you do need to give a data privacy notice to the data subject, which will tell them what they're, what you're doing with their data, the purpose for that, the length of time you're going to be processing that personal data, that's called the retention schedule, what other rights and freedoms they may have that you need to let them know that they've got under these under the new landscape. Also importantly, two points really importantly here, if you're sharing that personal data with a third party, which you might do, it may be being processed somewhere else, you need to let them know who that third party is, purposes for doing that, etc. for how long. And the second point I'd want to make is if anything were to go wrong or they had a problem or they had a concern or a complaint, who they should contact and how they can do that. So that's quite important too. Adi, on the point of data privacy notices, uh, Joanna Kennedy asks, what is the difference between a fair processing notice and a privacy notice? Do we need both? Right. Well, people used to call it a fair processing notice, and I still think they call it that. But actually, under the regulation, it's, 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 a, a, data, it's a data privacy notice. And so we ought to kind of use the right, the right lingo. <laughs> it's a data privacy notice. We've got Articles 13 and Articles 14. Articles 13 in relation to whether it's directly to that individual that we've got their personal data. Article 14 is if we've got it through um, a third party, for example. So it's a data privacy notice that we ought to give. Great, okay. And we actually had a couple of questions on the subject of photography and how GDPR might impact and people who work as photographers. I've got one that I'd like to pose to you, Ali, from Jill O'Sullivan, who says, we are a publisher that often take pictures at public events featuring minors. We publish these pictures and also offer them for sale. What are our obligations or exemptions under GDPR, both for publishing the pictures and selling them? Wow. <laughs> so that's a very good question. <laughs> um, because what it does, I'm kind of smiling, Jill, not because I think it's not a serious question. It is a serious question. And I'm sure it's a serious question for you. But what it does is it unlocks a lot of issues. So to begin with, if you're doing this for a commercial purpose, and let's assume for the purposes, Tom, this is a commercial um, situation, then you will have a client. Um, and the client will be instructing you to do something. And in relation to what they're asking you to do, they're, e they're going to be the data controller because they're the client. Now, if you're taking pictures of someone and you're doing that on the instructions of a client, then the first thing you've got to do, which is under Article 28 of the GDPR, is to make sure they're not in breach of the GDPR by doing it. So in fact, those instructions you've been given have to be lawfully given that actually if we are taking pictures of people, actually that your client has at a minimum got their consent to do that. Because in many respects, when pictures go out on the internet, as you probably know, I don't need to tell Jill this, but for those of you watching this afternoon, it's not just the picture you see, which like you're watching me now on this screen, because if this was a photograph, which it isn't of course, but if it was a photograph, you could actually go and click onto this image of me and find out all the metadata, which was when it was taken, where it was taken, the coordinates of that, you know, all sorts of stuff, actually, which perhaps we'd want to keep quiet because maybe I didn't want to let people know I wasn't at home at the time and uh, those kind of things. So it's really important that that's done to make sure that whoever we're taking pictures of, we've got their consent because clearly that's, that's important if they're the subject of the, the photograph. If they're incidental, because I had this question come up a few months ago, it might have been with you, Tom, I'm not, I can't remember, but if it's a football ground or a rugby ground, of course you can't get consent of everyone who's incidental to the picture of someone. And of course, photographers who do go to sports arenas do have to get the consent of the rights holder in order to take those pictures because, because they have to. Um, so that's one issue. The other issue, of course, is something which we're not going to go into in great detail today is intellectual property. So technically, 
when you take a picture, you are the copyright owner of it, unless you have an agreement in place which transfers those intellectual property rights. But again, that's nothing to do with what we're talking about today. So the number of factors to think about. The third one, which Jill mentioned in her question, if I can remember, is about children. Now that is very sensitive. I take um, my daughter, Aviva, to swimming classes on Saturday morning. And um, in fact, she's away at the moment. I think she might miss this Saturday. But anyway, we normally go every Saturday. It's great. I don't get in the pool, by the way. Um, I just sit there and watch her swim and she's taught to swim. She's rather good. But everywhere you see, there are, there are signs saying photography is not allowed. Parents, please do not take pictures of your children. And that's very, very important because there's no control over what may happen to those images. And very sadly, of course, we know there are problems um, with the sharing of these kind of images. And it's horrific. It's absolutely horrific. And so I totally, totally understand that actually those things have to be very tightly controlled. So where you are taking pictures of, of, of children or vulnerable people, then most clearly you are processing their personal data. And most clearly you would need in that case the explicit consent if they're the subject of the parent or guardian in that case. Sorry for the length of the answer, but it's quite it's quite important. Um, it also, just in case you were wondering, you're not a photographer, but maybe you have a CCTV camera. So maybe some of you are thinking, well, what about what happens there? There's some really great guidance on the ICO website. If you're in the UK, do have a look at that. That was made before the, the GDPR, but it's still relevant. Um, I think they've updated it a bit. Basically, that's a, a legitimate interest, you know, recording um, a doorway to make sure that people who need to come into the building come into the building. And, but you should only be recording that doorway. You shouldn't be recording the whole street, for example, because that just would be uh, unreasonable to do and also would be a breach of other people's rights and freedoms to be recorded by you. Also, even keeping that recording for any length of time, that has to be justified as well. So there are lots of sort of checks and balances but in that case, with a CCTV, for example, rather than a photographer using a camera, that, that would be under legitimate interest. Great, okay. And we actually have a follow-up question on the subject of photography from Kenneth Hogg, who um, asks, what's the guidance for use of employee photos? Well, it's a good question. And I know, um, Kenneth, um, that some organizations have made it a habit of doing an internal directory um, for you to get in touch with someone and they may have a picture of someone on that internal directory and um, you could argue well that's their personal data was it necessary to have a picture of me or you Kenneth in order for someone to give us a call internally I would argue not um, I think we would have a struggle if someone complained or in fact didn't want their picture on the internal telephone directory. So I think we couldn't force them to have their image uh, on it um, and that would be perfectly acceptable because we could still contact them, we just wouldn't know what they look like, but then do we need to know what they look like really? No. So I think that that's important. When we're thinking about processing employees' personal data, the the guidance on this is very clear. We can't rely on consent. And the reason we can't rely on consent is that there's an inequality in the bargaining power, if you like, between you and me, the employee, and the boss, the employer. And of course, we decided that we didn't want to uh, agree to that clause in that contract, which we may have signed ages ago, then there could be a problem. They may not even give us the job, you know, that kind of thing. Now, all that's gone. We, the employers can't rely on consent to process our personal data. They can, though, rely on legitimate interest to do so. Not in everything. Not everything can fall under the, uh, the banner of legitimate interest. And remember what I said earlier a couple of times, there still has to be a legitimate interest uh, assessment done, so that's clear. They have to share that with you, by the way, if you want to see that. So that's good. It's all about transparency. It's all about accountability. But clearly, there is legitimate interest because otherwise they can't employ you. There are things that we'd need to do 
with you. But if you were to join a loyalty scheme, a discount scheme, a bonus scheme, and that was discretionary from your point of view, you could join it or not join it, then they don't have to use legitimate interest. In fact, it would be inappropriate to do so. Remember, it's the most appropriate legal basis for processing personal data. So in that case, it's probably consent in that case. So just think about the context, which is really important, and make sure that at every point you're applying all the seven principles of data protection, and importantly, that um, if you are processing employees' personal data, then um, that's under legitimate interest, and you still have to give them a data privacy notice. And the, the footnote to that, that has to be separate, separate from any terms and conditions that you may give them. Cool, and we have a specific question here from Diogo Corte Real, who's um, asking about smartphone applications and opt-in, opt-out on applications that provide limited services yet capture personal data, for example, Garmin or um, a car application. How necessary is an opt-out button? Can a user not simply delete the app as long as they are informed of the data that's being captured? Well, it all depends on the basis upon which you've entered into an, a, a business um, arrangement or contract with that provider, really. Um, what they can't do is they can't force you to consent to something which is conditional. So in other words, they can't say you have to agree to all these rather onerous terms and conditions. Otherwise, you just can't have anything because the European Commission are a bit anti that. Um, there should be an opportunity for people to um, consume a product or service where they don't have to give consent to the processing of all their personal data because that would be unreasonable. Um, if you want them to access other features, then of course you'd have to justify processing further information about them in order for them to unlock those features. But this is less about opt out and much more about consent and i think one of the things we've got to do is we've got to change the use of our language to so thinking about opt-in and opt-out yes we had a bit of that with pecker yes people talk about the soft opt-in in a business to business environment but you know all this is going to go slowly into being a different type of language when we've got the e privacy regulation for the moment yes we've got that but think about this in a much more clearer way we're trying to be transparent we are trying to be accountable we're trying to put control back into the hands of the user that means we've got to be very very clear what are we doing with their personal data how does that work and if we're using contract we don't use to use consent but then contract it's only valid for as long as the contract is in place and we can't do anything outside of the terms agreed in that contract so think about what is being delivered how it's being delivered and what the most appropriate legal basis is for processing of personal data. Thank you, Adi. And back to a much more general question from John Schwab, who says, I would love to know how, as an employer, I can keep my team GDPR compliant. And his original question was, what do you see as the best way to keep a company GDPR compliant as they grow from a startup with two to four employees to a team of 15 within a year? It's a great question, John, and thank you so much for it, because although you may say it's a general question, it's a really important one. One of the things I've noticed about the GDPR, it's one of the very few regulations where all of us, irrespective of how big, medium or small we are, we're expected to continue to make sure that anyone who touches personal data is trained. Training is your frontline defense for yourself in terms of regarding your reputation as well. But it's also very important in terms of mitigating risk. Because if people aren't trained, if people don't know what to do, and I'll come back to how that can be done in a cost-effective way, then actually they're going to struggle. Because if there is a personal data breach, then the first thing that the Information Commissioner's Office will do in the UK or the Supervisory Authority, wherever you are, they'll ask to see the training records. And if those are not up to date, if it's not appropriate, something wrong with them then that's an immediate aggravating factor in terms of pushing the needle up not down in relation to any quantum in relation to sanctions and fines and that's irrespective of any compensation claims that you may get 
So you've got to know what you're meant to be doing. You've got to know where the personal data is. And one of the things we do at Henley is we take people through a one day workshop where I think I may have mentioned it at the beginning, Tom, we join the dots on business continuity, risk and technology. And certainly when we're talking about the DPO, if you recall earlier, I was talking just about that, joining the dots on business continuity, risk and technology in order to get the outcomes you require. Because you can be a very, very small business, but be processing some pretty risky personal data or, or special category of personal data, like health, for example, or biometric, or medical, anything like that. So you've got to make sure you comply. And that's really, really important. So training is your frontline defense. There are lots of um, training organizations out there, but there's only one business school. And we've also got 10 minute and 20 minute and one hour um, online training. Um, so um, have a look at that if that's of interest. But also um, educate yourself. Um, that's why I wrote the book. But I wrote the book very differently from every other book. By the way, I'll have a bookcase full of other people's books because I have to. I'm an educator at the end of the day and I do that professionally. Where this book is different, the GDPR handbook is different, is because it's written in colloquial English. It's written in ordinary language. And I think a lot of the other books can be a bit off-putting because it's very technical, very legalistic. And that doesn't really help you. I think you've really got to understand how you apply this. And that's the important thing, implementing it, applying it. But also think about this. If you're able to do this well, you can deepen digital trust to do more and not less with personal data. And that really is the prize. That's really the objective of why we've spent so much time creating the program at Henley, writing the book, training people, because we genuinely believe there's a great opportunity here. OK, and another question from Jill O'Sullivan, who asks, have you seen any system in operation that can manage a company wide data protection response spanning core business activities internal and external clients, retention periods, etc. Well, um, I'm not really here to promote anyone's product <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because that would be inappropriate. I, and I think w one of the things that I would suggest you do is you talk to an independent consultant and perhaps talk to them in terms of what your needs and requirements are and get them to do some analysis in terms of what tools are out there that could be appropriate for your organization needs and requirements because there's no one tool that does everything believe you me i get bombarded by people trying to flog me stuff or endorse it and i just don't get involved with that we sometimes get people who are vendors and there's no problem about being a vendor but to talk about the issues the challenges how their solution can meet that what is it about their solution that's good but also what what is it about their solution that needs to be further refined because nothing's perfect. And I think you need to have that kind of open book uh, approach. Certainly, I know if you came to the event, which we've got coming up shortly, I know Tom's going to make a mention of that uh, very shortly. On the 25th, uh, um, we have a GDPR um, summit in London. Um, it's a good opportunity to go and talk to people, but ask them the questions. How does this how does this help me comply? But also, how does it make my life easier? You know, how does it save me money? How does it save me time? How does this compare with other solutions that I may look at? You know, how does this work in terms of a bigger ecosystem? Um, the IAPP also do a terrific job in doing a vendor report. I think you can get that for free, irrespective of whether you're an IAPP member or not. So do have a look at that and they benchmark products and services. So they kind of do that. Um, I hope that helps. OK, Adi, um, we've got six minutes left. There were a couple of questions on cookies. Um, I'm just wondering if you'd be interested in taking those. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have uh, another question from Jill O'Sullivan who asks, is it permissible under GDPR to roadblock access to a website until the user accepts cookies? Interesting point, really. Um, well, it depends. <laughs> I know that's what the American websites did, the news websites did, but what they forgot to do, they blocked it because they panicked. And they thought, oh, God, we haven't done anything about GDPR. 
blah, blah, blah. We're going to be in breach. We're just going to stop people accessing the site. Well, they actually, they still had they still had prices in euros and pounds on it, which actually would have meant that they were still marketing to European Union citizens. Um, I think you've got to be absolutely clear. What is it you're trying to do? Um, who is it you're trying to target? And if you're processing their personal data, have you done that in accordance with the GDPR? Um, simply by blocking access may not be enough. Okay, and Fuji Kusu Kusaka, apologies if I'm struggling with names here today. We've got people from all over the world, I think, on this webinar. And um, we'd like to know, um, you'd like to know more about what to capture when implementing cookie acceptance. What are the best pra approach practices? Well, of course, we can't go into the great de detail of cookies. You've got, you know, you've, you, 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 you've got cookies which are required from a technical point of view, and you've got cookies in, re in relation to your behavior, okay? Um, and of course, um, when you, every time you vis we visit a website, you may have a session cookie planted on your machine to allow you to access that website, but it shouldn't be processing your personal data. I think, I think at, in any event, when you're thinking about processing personal data, only process the minimal amount of personal data that you need in order to deliver that experience, to deliver that product, to deliver that service. Do not over collect information. That's really, really important. And if you are tracking or profiling under the GDPR, profiling doesn't require consent, but you do need to let people know that you're doing it and they have a right to object to you doing it. That's important. So the data privacy notice has to be very clear and prior to the to you processing their personal data. One more question, Adi, um, which I think you'll find interesting. Is there likely to be a GDPR certification soon, like the ISO 9000? Well, one of the things I hinted at was um, there is actually um, marks and certification under the GDPR for organizations. It doesn't exist at the moment because each independent supervisory authority has to put that framework in place in their own backyard, so to speak. And, um, you know, that isn't going to happen anytime soon. What we did in absence of that is look at the British standard and the British standard 20, uh, 10,012, 2017. It's going to be recently updated to 2018. So it's 10,012, 2017. It's called a personal information management system. Um, I helped navigate Hitachi through that. That was a really great framework for them in terms of how they were going to demonstrate they have a culture of compliance. as a Japanese company. Um, they've got very strong values. And of course, the GDPR and their values mapped. They were able to achieve that. In fact, they were the first to achieve it here in the UK, and that was terrific. And in fact, there's a film about it, which I have put up on LinkedIn, which you can find um, BSI. You put my name in, you'll see it. And there's a little short film about that. Um, whether we're going to certify people as being GDPR compliant is a different matter. Um, I don't think we're going to be there yet. I think you have to be very, very careful that if you're using a consultant, at least find out what they've done to prepare themselves, how they've kept their knowledge and skills and experience up to date, and make sure that they're properly trained. Okay, great. And unfortunately, uh, our is up. We did manage to get through everyone's questions, I believe, from cool. what you have in front of me. And yeah, I think um, that was a valuable session, Ardy. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure. Back to you, Tom. Uh and um, before we go, I would just like to remind everyone that the event next Monday um, is taking place between uh, 9 a.m. 5 p.m. Registration open from 8.15 in the morning. And would just like to invite everyone attending to answer the question on screen about which keynote theatre they were most interested in attending. Um, we would like to gauge numbers in advance. Um, but beyond that, we look forward to seeing you on Monday. And thank you for, uh, for listening. See you then. Thank you. See you, Adi. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.